Welcome to Rapid Set Metal Buildings and another informational video. Today's discussion is going to be about failure, building failures. And a steel building, we're not talking about wood rot, termites, and pull out force and nails. We are talking about steel buildings. There are two major failures that's going to be in shear and deflection. Now, first of all, before we can talk about failures, we've got to talk about the forces where these forces come from and how they're comprised. There are two different kinds of forces. Basically, you have, as represented by the large arrow up here, it's called a concentrated force. This is a load that's put on the building in one very specific area. It's a, it's a central force, it's in pounds or tons, but it's not moving anywhere. An example of this is a lean-to mounted to the side columns of a larger building. It's going to be supporting that lean-to and its weight. A large hanger door mounted from the end wall frame. A lift, a little crane or hoist that's mounted from a sidewall column or from a rafter. Or an HVAC unit that is mounted up on the roof. These are concentrated loads that are going to stay in one position. They have to be accounted for. Now, the next type of, of force that we have is represented by the small aerials, and that's a distributive force. A distributive force is in pounds per square foot. You'll find those in your snow load, your collateral load, your dead load, your live load, and your wind load. Yes, a 90 mile an hour wind equates to about 21 pounds per square foot of pressure onto a building. Now, in a little 30 by 50 foot example, and these were things that we covered under the codes and loads video, you take a look at that 30 by 50 building, a small building. It's roughly got about 1,500 square feet of roof area to it. And let's supply a mild load to it. A 30 pound snow load, a one pound collateral, a two pound dead. Well, we've got 33 pounds per square foot on that roof. Now, if you remember in codes and loads, that's provided that's a roof snow. If that's a ground snow, I've only got 21 pounds per square foot. I lost nine pounds. And nine pounds per square foot in a little 30 by 50 foot building uh, comes out to about 13,500 pounds or close to seven tons. It was not accounted for. Now both these type forces affect every part of the building. That's why these things are so important and to make sure that they are all accounted for. Now, let's go into the two failures. Shear. Shear is where a force is trying to rip a building apart. Uh, at different locations during the roof and during the walls, you have a sheet that is not supported directly behind it. It doesn't have a, a, a column. It doesn't have a girt. It's just basically supporting itself where the rest of it has got some type of a structural back to it. So what it's trying to do is get that sheet oil canning or pushing away and it's going to cause a ripping. Well, the same shear goes into the fasteners where the sheeting is trying to separate that head from the, from the metal fastener. That force is going into your secondary steel affecting your girts and purlins and the bolts that are attaching them to the primary steel. That force is transferred to the primary steel and the nuts and bolts that are holding it together. So it's, it's all interrelated on a steel building. Now the next type of deflection or a type of failure we have is deflection. Now deflection is defined as a member moving from its original shape. In other words, it, was, it is being forced to deflect. Now, there are many different areas or categories that, that buildings can fall under. And this building code, this big ugly book that is not nighttime reading. It'll give you nightmares. It is, it is ugly. Uh, but in there, it tells us how much deflection is allowed. Now here I've got a little structural member of 20 feet, I'm going to use for an example, that's 240 inches, and I'm applying a load to it. Now, as the building code book indicates, depending on how the structure is being used, 
and the category it falls under tells us just how much a deflection we can have. These fall in several different categories. Today we're going to talk about three primarily. The first one, agricultural building, we're going to throw that out because that is nothing but storage. That is allowed to deflect to uh, enormous amount. It's a very weak type building. People are not going to be in that, maybe a few times a year. So that is the lowest possible. Our normal building, by definition, by the codes, that 20-foot beam with the force on it is allowed to deflect 1.33 inches, stating that at 1.33, Anything less than that is considered safe. Anything greater than that is a failure. Now, the next category is a higher occupancy category. This comes from churches, uh, assembly halls, uh, auditoriums, gymnasiums. The, that same 20-foot beam is only allowed to deflect one inch. Now, this deflection is a stress and strain ratio or a deflection per linear length of structure. That's how they come up with this number. The next one is a emergency type situation. Hospitals, fire departments, police stations. Um, they put a completely different value. Now suddenly that same beam can only deflect about five-eighths of an inch. And the last one, we use that in occasions for cranes. Now, imagine you've got five to 50 tons or greater suspended overhead. People are working underneath this. Here, the deflection is about a half an inch. So we've gone a pretty far distance in these few categories as far as the, the deflection allowed or the structural integrity of a member. Now, for years, we have had not much of a choice. Everything was, was hot rolled, everything was in a catalog. Your ability to make different selections was quite not there. As an example, here is a hot rolled I-beam. It's very simple. Your two flanges on the outside and your web on the in inside. Your flanges were a certain width, a certain thickness, your web was a certain thickness, a certain height. So basically, once you knew what your deflection was, you would plug it into a formula and you would come out with what was called a moment of inertia. Now, that is the member's actual capability of resisting a deflection. Now, the choices weren't very big. If this was an I-beam, you could have a, a 10, a 12, or a 14-inch I-beam that all had the same moment of inertia. So the only real change that we had or, or ability to cut costs in a building was to, number one, get as close to that number as you possibly can where you're using less steel, and number two, going to a higher. Uh, you take a 10-foot high beam let's say with a moment of inertia of 300, 400. Okay, you might find that same beam in a 12 inch, but the weight, instead of being 65 pounds per foot, will only be 52. You might be able to find it again in a 14 inch beam, and your weight will once again go down. Now, you're probably asking, why would you even design a building that's going to deflect cost? That is the bottom line. If I've got a competitor out there that has designed that building to where it's going to deflect, let's say, an inch and a quarter, it's within the safety range, and if mine doesn't deflect at all, I am using considerably more steel. I have the funniest feeling he's going to get every sale and not me. Now, nothing happened for years. It was, it was a very, very simple business. And then some sharper people sat down one day and said, hey, you know, we don't need the strength at the base of a column. We need it at the joint. On a rafter, we don't need the strength at the crest of the building. We need it at the joint. And they came up with a tapered beam. With the assistance of, of differential equations, they're capable of calculating the forces acting on that beam from ground level all the way up to the haunch connection. 
And they said they came up with the tapered beam, spending no more steel than was actually needed. As an example, I've ran a small building. The exact same building has two different frames in it. One is the tapered beam. The other is our standard old hot rolled beam that we catalog for 80 years. You can see the difference of how it tapers down to the base. You can see the difference of how it tapers at the crest of the building. This particular frame is 18% less in weight and in cost than the lower one. That is why we went into tapered beams. Well, in doing so, they also found out that no longer do the flanges have to be the same width, the same thickness. They can be completely different from each other and the web is also being changed. In a case like that, the outer flange under a load might be have more of a compression load on it. The inner flange might have more of a tension load and the shear load on the web. So now they can adjust any one of these independently. So the, the, the catalog of available beams now is gigantic. The amount of spread in between the movement of inertia values is greater. Suddenly we don't have to go from a 10 to a 14 inch beam just to get the cost down, but we can actually taper it, come up with a much, much stronger beam without giving up any of its physical properties. Now, through all these years, the calculations to determine the amount of deflection, the structural composition of steel, nothing has changed. This is probably the newest thing that we've come up with in all these years. Now again, it's, we know what forces are applying, we know that there is a capability of, of deflection. It kind of brings a, a question into mind now is that that person that really trimmed that, let's say he got down to one and a quarter inches. Let's go back to that 30 by 50 foot building. Did they use ground snow instead of roof snow? Did they use the right category? the right wind speed, the right code for that wind speed in your area. Was it a reducible load? All these things are into consideration because if we were trimming that so close and we left out that 13,500 pounds, the difference between ground snow and roof snow, it'll probably fail. Thank you for joining us and please come back, visit our website and see more of the informational videos that we offer. I'm Steve Carter saying goodbye.